Tonight is a security firm trying to capitalize on a 1.2 billion password hack. A Microsoft tip leads to a child porn arrest. And what is so special about Foursquare's new app? Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 145 for Wednesday, August 6th, 2014. This episode is brought to you by Personal Capital. With Personal Capital, you'll finally have all your financial life in one place and get a clear view of everything you own. Best of all, it's free. To sign up, go to personalcapital.com slash TN2. Hello all, I'm Sarah Lane, and let's get right into today's tech feed. Yesterday, we passed along a New York Times report that a Russian crime ring had stolen the largest known amount of personal information to date. 1.2 billion accounts, 500 million unique email addresses, 420,000 websites. This was revealed by security firm Hold Security. Both Forbes and the Wall Street Journal have pointed out something might seem odd. Hold Security is charging a not insignificant $120 per year subscription to anybody who wants to check if their name and password are on that list. The Verge also notes that the very number of 1.2 billion usernames is interesting. Facebook or Google Search or Microsoft Office all are single services that have that kind of user base, but this data is coming from hundreds of thousands of compromises over the course of months, not from single services. Add to the fact that apparently the hackers are using this data for Twitter spam only, and the hold security collection fee might be read as a bit high, at least by some people. Microsoft continues to lose money on its Surface tablets, and in its most recent fiscal quarter added hundreds of millions of dollars to total losses of $1.7 billion since the device launched in 2012. Computer World has calculated that the Surface's cost of revenue for the most recent quarter was $772 million, and with revenue of $409 million that put the tablet underwater around $363 million. That is just for the quarter. That's the largest one-quarter loss for the Surface since Microsoft began providing quarterly revenue numbers. Microsoft was expected to launch a smaller screen Surface Mini alongside the Surface Pro 3 back in May, but scrapped the idea, which was believed to be because the company didn't think the tablet would sell well. A flagged Microsoft OneDrive cloud storage account has led to the arrest of a man in Pennsylvania who had been charged with receiving and sharing child abuse images. According to court documents, the man was then detected trying to send two illegal pictures via one of Microsoft's Live.com email accounts. A copy of the affidavit detailing the case against the defendant claims that the man acknowledged that he acquired the pictures through Keek Messenger, that's a chat app, as well as trading and receiving images of child pornography on his mobile cellular device. Despite concerns over privacy based on the fact that this user was clearly being monitored in some way, Microsoft's terms and conditions for U.S. users explicitly state that it has the right to deploy, quote, automatic technologies to detect child pornography or abusive behavior that might harm the system, our customers, or others. The Chinese government's crackdown of foreign company products continues. The latest victims, Apple's iPad, iPad Mini, MacBook Air, and MacBook Pro – None of them can be bought with public money for government purchases because of security concerns. This is reported by Bloomberg, citing government officials familiar with the matter. China's procurement agency previously told departments to stop buying antivirus software from Symantec and Kapersky Lab, and Microsoft was shut out of a government purchase of energy-efficient computers. The scrutiny of foreign companies reportedly stems from Edward Snowden's revelations last year of NSA spying programs and the May announcement of indictments by U.S. prosecutors of five Chinese military officers for allegedly stealing corporate secrets. Well, here's some good news, unless you really like patent lawsuits. Apple and Samsung have agreed to end their global patent battle, or at least start winding it down anyway, and have explained in a joint statement that they will drop all suits against each other in countries outside the U.S. Claims are being abandoned in Australia, Japan, South Korea, Germany, the Netherlands, the U.K., France, and Italy. In the drawn-out patent battle, Apple accused Samsung of copying its iPhone designs, and Samsung countered that Apple was using pieces of its wireless transmission technology without permission. Judges had repeatedly urged the companies to settle rather than continue to dispute in court. And 
Yes, the company's finally agreed. Amazon has announced that its same-day delivery service, which is already serving San Francisco, Los Angeles, Phoenix, and Seattle metro areas, is expanding to new cities, including Baltimore, Dallas, Indianapolis, New York City, Philadelphia, and Washington, D.C. Amazon Prime customers in these markets and others that already have the access to the Get It Today option can order select items like movies or video games or travel items or school supplies by noon and then receive them the same day for a $5.99 additional fee. Amazon's same-day delivery service runs seven days a week, but doesn't include groceries, although Amazon is experimenting with grocery delivery through Amazon Fresh in Seattle and in parts of California. Coming up, would you like to see a really, really good map of the moon? Now you can. You can also go to Mars on Google Maps. Tell you more about that in a few. And up next, I'll chat with Martin Bryant from The Next Web about the launch of Foursquare's new app, Things Have Changed. But first, let's take a break and thank Personal Capital for sponsoring this episode of Tech News Tonight. It's a free and secure tool that solves the problems that you might have growing your wealth, saving your money, getting richer. The first barrier is it's hard to keep track of stocks, your 401k accounts, your bank accounts. Those might have, you know, multiple sites and logins and different usernames, and maybe you're not checking them as often as you, as you could. You could pay somebody to manage your money, but that's never free. Personal Capital brings all of your accounts and assets onto a single screen that you can access on not only your computer, but your phone or your tablet with, uh, with intuitive graphs that are updated in real time. Personal Capital has an app. You can download it in the Google Play Store that will integrate Personal Capital with Android devices. And as a user, you get relevant and timely updates on your finances wherever you are, whenever you need them. Personal Capital shows how much you're overpaying how to, how to get those fees down or eliminate them altogether. And you also get tailored advice based on your personal investment and how to optimize it. So shouldn't wait. Signing up just takes a minute and it'll pay you back. Personal Capital gives you total clarity and transparency to make better investment decisions right away. To set up your free account, go to personalcapital.com slash TN and the number two. Personal Capital is free and it's a smart way to grow your money. And thanks to Personal Capital for their support of... Tech News Tonight. All right, joining us now is Martin Bryant, Editor-in-Chief over at The Next Web. Hey, Martin. Hello. Thanks for being back on TN2. It's a pleasure to be here. We were talking before the show that I told you that I looked at my iPhone this morning and I got scared because on my home screen there was an app I'd never seen before, but it's just Foursquare's updated logo because it's finally launched that redesigned mobile app that the company had told users it was definitely going to do. That's part of the split out from Swarm, which is what their new check-in app is. So what does Foursquare do now? What What is the point? Um, this is basically um, think Yelp, uh, that, and you've got the basic idea. It's 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 all the recommendations and the tips and reviews uh, from the old version of Foursquare. Um, it's just got rid of all the check-ins, all uh, most of most of the social stuff, and it's really all about uh, you helping you find somewhere new to go, helping you. Uh, you know, if you're you're in a new city, you want to find somewhere uh, for breakfast, or you know, you you're, you're out in your home city, you want to find something for lunch, that kind of thing, uh, based on all the data, not only from your check-ins and your own tips, uh, also your friends um, and uh, um, all kind of clever algorithmic stuff in the background. Um, I think it's actually a really nice app. It's uh, it's a lot more focused now. Um, it, it looks very nice. I think on an iPhone, the screen, uh, it, it looks a bit squished. Uh, it'll certainly benefit from the uh, supposed bigger screen on the next iPhone. But um, uh, as an app for finding your way around and finding new things to do, um, it, it, it's really nice. I've just been exploring it and finding all sorts of things about the city I didn't even know about. Well, besides some obvious design changes, in fact, it, it almost reminds me of Flickr's color scheme, but th that aside, you mentioned Yelp, but Yelp, you could think of as, Yelp has always tried to push the local business option. Foursquare is just sticking with food. Why do you think they decided to do that? Um, well, I suppose uh, they've been really narrowing down what they're about. I think uh, Foursquare was uh, very much about lots of things. To some people, it was a game. Some people, it was like a location diary. I mean, that's how I use Swarm. I, I When I check in, I, I keep a location diary of everywhere I go. It's, it's just a really nice way of kind of looking back later. Um, other people did use it to explore. Other people use it all sorts of different reasons. So by 
you know, by focusing on food, I think that's that, that's quite a, a broad kind of universal thing. We all need to eat. So, uh, and, and it doesn't narrow it down to a really small demographic, like going out to bars would keep it to, to young people. Uh, maybe, um, maybe not, but uh, uh, more young people. And um, uh, so I think food is a, a nice universal thing that, um, uh, that, that focuses the app. All right. So if Foursquare is no longer about check-ins, but Swarm, which is basically the spin-off app made by the same company is how easy do you think that is to not only alienate users who liked the way that things used to be but be able to convince users new users that they need both of these apps yeah, it's a d difficult one. Uh, it, it's it's one of these unbundling um, uh, strategies uh, which are, are becoming um, fashionable, certainly to talk about in the tech press. Anyway, uh, mainly mainly Facebook who's been uh, doing it um, so far. But um, uh, yeah, so I think that the problem with this kind of unbundling is it, it's more in the business interests of the company that's doing it than the existing users. So you get a lot of kickback. You get 1.5 stars uh, for Swarm uh, review in the App Store. That kind of thing. Um, uh, I just tweeted before I came on here that I was going on to talk about Foursquare. Uh, first reply I got was, um, make sure you tell them uh, Foursquare is terrible. Um, so <laughs> there's this kind, of, there's this, uh, there's this feeling now that um, people um, Foursquare has abandoned them. Someone was uh, telling me that they want to, they want a, a free open source um, alternative instead, because uh, users always get um, sold down the river um, in these kinds of situations. Um, I think as a product. Um, they both make sense, Swarm and Foursquare now. It's just getting new users on board um, might be difficult. If you're used to Yelp, you might think, well, why should I go to, you know, why should I uh, try Foursquare? Um, and you won't have the benefit of all that data that you've built up already. Um, and then if, uh, you know, if you've been using it for a while. And Swarm, um, I think without the gamification, um, it, it, it doesn't feel as complete. Um, they've got rid of all the leaderboards, the points. I loved the check-in um, uh, points and leaderboards you got. Um, you know, you check in somewhere, you, uh, you've not checked in before and you get like 20 points for all these different reasons and it was just really exciting and really nice and um, now um, it just feels a bit hollow swarm um, I can see where what other people are doing but it, it's it's a utility rather than any fun um, so it's, it's definitely a challenging time for Foursquare but it's Foursquare's real asset is all that data it's built up um, uh, the Wall Street Journal uh, today reporting that um, uh, the new Foursquare app um, not just Swan the new Foursquare app actually tracks you in the background all the time to try and see what 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 data uh, it can um, uh, um, generate from all of that. Uh, so really, it, it, it's a very rich data play, and it's an impressive data play. Um, it's just whether anyone still wants to play with their data play. Well, you know, you mentioned, yeah, tracking tracking users, even if the app is closed, let's say. Mm. Didn't Foursquare do that already, though? Because if I had push notifications on when there was a special nearby me, and I wasn't actively using Foursquare, Foursquare was already paying attention to where I was physically, right? Uh, yeah, but I think I think you maybe wouldn't expect that um, it, on, from an app that wasn't about location sharing, because then you're getting something instantly back, aren't you? Uh, yeah, and it's all about you know kind of uh, checking in quickly, seeing where your friends are, and you know you you probably expect that to run in the background. Um, uh, maybe people um, using this as a utility to explore um, the city and just open it every now and then and say, oh, you know, where shall we go for breakfast? Uh, it, you don't necessarily want it running in the background all the time. Um, you can opt out. Uh, but, um, uh, yeah, maybe a, a little surprising for some users at least. Yeah, I guess that maybe it's the opt out that bothers people so much. But then again, if you never opt in, it's not going to be a very compelling app, is it? It's, it's a strange little line you have to walk when you're an app maker who wants to provide the best experience possible but not scare everybody. See also Google exactly. Yeah, <laughs> right. it's uh, it, it's uh, it's the creepy line, and uh, it, it's something that uh, it's constantly moving, um, being pushed, particularly by uh, Silicon Valley companies, or as well as in this case a New York company. But um, uh, but uh, yeah, that dance between users and uh, companies, and uh, what's too creepy, um, uh, and I think we become more accepting of things over time. I remember when um, uh, when Google Latitude launched um, and everyone thought it was crazy that anyone would want um, uh, uh, Google tracking you all the time. And um, you know anyone who's got an Android phone now is being tracked by Google all the time. And it, it just kind of becomes normal. Martin Bryan is the editor-in-chief over at The Next Web. Thanks so much for joining us again, Martin. And let folks know where they can keep up with you. 
Uh, yeah, you can follow uh, the next web at thenextweb.com. We have uh, see, uh, a team 24 hours a day covering tech news. And uh, uh, personally, I'm Martin SFP on Twitter. Thanks so much, Martin. Thanks. All right, finally, why don't we fly ourselves to the moon? Google has introduced a feature on Google Maps. This is really cool. It lets you visit, sort of, not just the moon, but actually Mars, you know. The big old red planet. It's not It's not exactly street view quality, but it's pretty stunning nonetheless. So here's what you do. You go to Google Maps. You click the button in the bottom left corner and zoom out for a full view of the Earth. And then you have two new options along the bottom that have been added to visit the moon or visit Mars. And from there, it's all you, Space Explorer. Go nuts. Very cool. And that is it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. Thanks for being here. You can subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. You can write us with feedback at TN2 at twit.tv. And don't miss Tech News Today. That is tomorrow. And every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, I'm Sarah Lane. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by cashfly.com.